Welcome to this Sydney Ideas event as we explore ways to create change for children and young people. I'm your host, Judy Cashmore uh, from Sydney University, and it's great to have your company too on uh, Zoom and LinkedIn Live. If you'd like to access live captions, they're available and the details are on your screen now. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm currently on Gadigal, the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country on which you are on and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to all First Nation people present today. Again, welcome to you uh, for the Sydney uh, Ideas events on a really important topic. How do we create change for young people in out of children and young people in out of home care? And what's really important is young people as experts in their own lives. And we have benefit of those people with us here today. Children and young people have the right to be involved in decisions that affect their lives. Um, that's part of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and particularly Article 12. And we hear that sort of rhetoric often, but it doesn't always translate into practice. For children and young people who are removed from their families into out of home care, it often is very difficult for them to have a say in the decisions that really affect their lives. Who they live with, uh, how much they see members of their family and other people who are important to them, where they go to school, where, how and often, and, and how often do they see people in their family and siblings and friends that they're not living with. So it's today we're going to hear from a leading US researcher in this field, Professor Peter Pecora, who's also the research director for Casey Family Programs, and we'll hear more about that later. And three young women who are all experts by experience and in out of home care from different perspectives. And the materials and their insights are so important to what we're talking about. So I'd also like to um, say again, if you're joining us on Zoom or LinkedIn Live, it's great to have your company. And now um, I'd like to introduce Amy, Professor Amy uh, Conley Wright, who is the director of the Research Centre for Children and Families a centre that I have the great honour and privilege to work with. It's been a real pleasure to be involved in this research. And Amy is um, uh, trained by social worker. She can tell you and will, will, is going to be hosting uh, the session with Billy and Bobby and Tegan. Over to you, Amy. Thank you so much, Judy. So we're here today to share with you about the Fostering Lifelong Connections Project, which is an ARC linkage project with our partners, the Department of Communities and Justice, New South Wales, and seven non-governmental organizations. And I'd like to start with some context about why we initiated this project. Australia's history has shaped a unique path to permanency for children in out-of-home care that includes an emphasis on sustained relationships with family if children will not be restored or reunified to their family's care and instead will remain on a long-term legal order, such as a long-term foster care, kinship, uh, guardianship, or open adoption. It's the legacy of the stolen generations, forced adoptions, and the forgotten Australian child migrants that we recognize now denied people the opportunity to know the part of themselves that came from their family, which includes culture and left painful, enduring, and wide-ranging consequences. So today, even when reunification to the family is, is birth to the parents is not an option, children's right to remain connected to their family is upheld in New South Wales in, in other state and territory legislation in Australia. And an approach, as Judy said, 
that is consistent with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which endorses the right of the child who is separated from one or both parents to maintain personal relations and direct contact with both parents on a regular basis, except if it is contrary to the child's interests. So with that right in mind, and that set of legislation underpinning this project, you know, we recognize that even though these practice uh, these contact visits are the child's right and they're in legislation, there's been limited evidence to guide practice about what helps make contact a safe and positive experience for children and what gets in the way of that and how can we overcome those obstacles. And this isn't a critical uh, knowledge gap because children in out of home care have inevitably experienced some kind of a trauma that can be either directly attributable to the experiences of um, abuse and neglect that have, may have led them to come into care or separation from their primary attachment figures and their parents, or both. So we need to make sure that that contact and, and um, family connections is safe for children and positive. So in response to this gap in research and practice, our research team came together to develop a successful Australian Research Council linkage grant called Fostering Lifelong Connections for Children in Permanent Care. And this project is a partnership between the University of Sydney, New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice, and seven non-governmental organizations, which are Bernardo's Australia, Care South, Catholic Care Hunter Manning, Catholic Care Wollongong, Key Assets, Wesley Delmar, and Uniting. And we work with caseworkers and caseworker managers who are employed by those organizations in order to identify relationship building practices and co-design resources with them. We conduct action research, which means that we we work alongside these caseworkers and caseworker managers to trial these practices and to implement them and to study them to see when you change the way you work with families, um, what changes, you know, what can we learn from that. And we're seeking to implement these new changes in the four project sites in, around New South Wales, which are Dubbo, uh, the Maitland, Newcastle area, Wollongong, and also Sydney. And then also to disseminate this broadly to the out of home care sector. So we're, we're developing practice resources and trainings that we want to get out across New South Wales, across Australia and internationally so that other children and families can benefit. Our team uh, of researchers includes extensive applied research working with children and families and communities. The chief investigators are uh, myself, Professor Judy Cashmore, Associate Professor Lynette Riley, Dr. Susan Collings, and we have two partner investigators, Professor Peter Pecora, who you'll hear from in a moment, and Professor Beth Neal. And Sarah Chifchi is our project coordinator. And we are all in the Sydney School of Education and Social Work at the University of Sydney. And we're working with an expert reference group, which is composed of experts by profession who come from out of home care agencies, governments, and the judiciary, who bring their local practice knowledge, and experts by experience who have personal experience with the out of home care sector. And they provide a real world perspective based on their lived experience that you're going to hear about today. And these co researchers, have designed resources for use by caseworkers, carers, family members, and children. And now you're going to meet some of them. So it's my pleasure now to introduce the experts by experience who have made such an enormous contribution to our project. So I'd like to introduce Billy Black. Billy Black is an artist who grew up in care and since leaving the system has been involved in research projects, training carers and caseworkers, and represents the voice of children on a care authorization panel. She's now raising two babies of uh, her own while undertaking a master's of research. Billy is passionate about research and strengths-based therapeutic care and aims to use her experience to develop resources for staff and carers who work with children in care. And with, with Billy is Bobby Hendry, who's a graphic designer and a photographer with lived experience in the out-of-home care si system. She's passionate about using her creative skills and her story to incite progress and change in the out-of-home care sphere so that her very typical experience of growing up with constant disruption and feelings of powerlessness and lack of control is no longer the typical experience for other children and teens. And Tegan Whitaker became a parent at age 18 and has firsthand experience of the child protection system. She's passionate about using her experiences as a parent with a child in, this, in care to improve the system and wants to th see things change so that parents like her can be peer mentors Tegan is currently studying psychology. So I'm going to ask now Billy, Bobby, and Tegan to please switch on your cameras and unmute. I'm going to ask you some questions now. So thank you again for being with us. Hi. 
So I'm going to start with Billy and Bobby. So when you were ch uh, children in care, in the care system, what was it like when you tried to get adults to hear your voice around decisions that affected your life? First up, um, the first real quagmire in getting my story heard was not knowing that I actually could have a say in a lot of decisions that affected me. So that really affected a lot of things, especially when it came to family time. Now, family time, for those who aren't aware, is the new nice old term uh, that used to be called access or contact. It's essentially just contact family visitation. Mm. Um, and I found family time an especially, especially difficult, um, you know, experience. Um, and I think if I had have known, I could speak up about the struggles I was having. I could speak up about what I wanted to do with family time. If I knew I had some level of control, that would have really helped, um, yeah, have my voice heard. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the main issue that we find with children trying to have a voice in this system is that children are just surrounded by adults and adults sort of just decide what children do and uh, you know, have a lot of control over every aspect of children's lives. So I think that's a really common story. It certainly was my story that when I was um, in care, I just didn't know what I was allowed to ask for. I didn't know what my rights were. Um, no one ever explained that to me. In fact, nobody ever even explained to me what a caseworker was and what their job was, even though I knew I had one and I knew that I was supposed to talk to them. It wasn't until I think I was about 18 that I finally asked, what is your job? What am I supposed to use you for actually? Um, because it takes a lot of maturity and um, articulacy to be able to articulate something like that. So, you know, yes, we've been on a bit of a euphemism treadmill with calling this time different things. Um, family time isn't necessarily the perfect, uh, you know, name for it either because family can be quite a loaded term for children in care. Um, but uh, something that was really relevant to me was that I understood it as birth family contact, it was called for me. Um, and I thought that that meant that it had to be blood family relations that um, I really didn't want to go to contact who I didn't realize I could refuse to go or ask not to go or ask to go in a different way, you know, uh, by phone call or there are lots of ways that you can have uh, this family time in this contact that wouldn't have been as threatening as what it ended up being. I also didn't know for a long time that there were childhood friends that I would have been able to use that time to visit and really, you know, build up my lifelong connection with um, because they didn't fall into that birth family sphere. Although now that, you know, I did eventually end up getting to do that because I was asking for help and uh, asking caseworkers to provide me support with this, um, I ended up being able to sustain those lifelong connections and I consider those childhood friends to be almost like siblings today. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing your perspectives and explaining what we mean by family time, because as you said, there's a lot of jargon, but what we mean is that time with family or people you consider to be like family, like your friends, Billy, as you said. Now, Tegan, from the perspective of a parent with a child in a care system, what has it been like for you to get your voice heard? <laughs> it, it's kind of like it's not, it, it feels an awful lot like it's never going to be heard. This is what one of the best things about this project was it was the first instance in the whole time since removal where I actually felt like I was finally heard and had a voice. And it, it really just was this eye-opening chance to find out that people do want to give birth parents that voice, we're just trying to find out how to best do it. And it needs a lot of trust from people on my end. And, and having children in care, it's like this roller coaster of caseworker after caseworker after caseworker. And I can tell you in five years, I have had 18 different caseworkers, some for a week, some for longer. Um, and it's just been really, really intense. And it's hard to maintain um, family time and set times when you don't even know who your caseworker is for that month. It's It's been really intense. So I'm really looking forward to the results and seeing this impact people because it's just really going to make a huge difference for every side. Thank you, Tegan. And like you said, it's it's the relationships that the caseworkers have with the family members. Yeah. It's also so important to facilitate those relationships between the carers and the family members and the child. Yeah, and that's something that never happens. There's never any sort of um, 
interaction between the care and the birth family. And this is something that would alleviate so much anxiety to a birth parent to go, well, this is who is taking care of my child. This is someone I could see doing a good job of taking care of my child, whether that be temporarily while I sort myself out or whether it's they are going to take care of them and be their custodian or carer while I continue down the path I'm on, but still keeping them safe and loved and working as a team. That is one thing that I haven't seen a lot of is this teamwork to raise children. And I really hope for that to come through eventually. And that's something you told us is that there's enough love to go around for the child. Yes. I love that yes. message. That's what we need to get out there. Yeah. And so you shared, so you can share about what it's been like to be part of the research. So Billy and Bobby, can you tell us what it's been like? Um, why is it important for you to work with researchers to make change in out of home care? You know, I think that uh, there's a temptation and a tendency to see people who have, uh, you know, a long history in academia um, who are, you know, uh, managers of departments that, you know, are in the seats of power, the position of power. There's a temptation to see those people as being um, good authorities for research. And it's only just recently that we're starting to give proper credit and merit to the, uh, the lived experience of people who have actually experienced the other side of this system, the seat of zero power. And so I think that there is basically no one with less power in this care system than the children who are in care and their birth families. And because I think we're all very used to that and we're used to, you know, um, have been, you know having it assumed that we uh, won't be able to be in control of our own lives, we also feel very sort of awkward and shy about putting up our hand to say, you know, actually, I have a lot of knowledge about this situation and actually I have some opinions on how to change the care system for the better. Uh, the benefit of using experts by experience, uh, children who experience the care system and their birth families, is that those people who have experienced powerlessness in the relationship that we've had with the care system is that that can then very directly impact the people who are still in the care system and still, you know, living this experience. We can, you know, tell you, um, and experts by experience can tell you uh, what difficulties there are that you could make the most amount of impact and often what could make the most amount of impact with the smallest amount of, you know, extra funds and resources? Because, you know, we've had that experience, all of us, of what have been the highlights of, uh, you know, caseworkers and carers that have been able to provide really good quality of care um, using only just a simple idea or just this simple, you know, $20 for a suitcase instead of a garbage bag when you move a child and things like that. There are lots of mm. very, very small ways to improve the system and go for progress rather than perfection that we are able to see now the system change. I've seen it change over the last 15 years. It feels like leaps and bounds, even though it's been so slow, such slow progress, it's been really amazing progress. Yeah, like even little steps. You take little steps and you look back behind you and suddenly they've all amounted to a lot. And I think, yeah, just to echo what Billy said there, like I think there's so much value to be added in the sharing of these stories. And we've proven that just on this panel, just having that perspective from other people who have that lived experience has been so powerful and to be honest like researchers should listen to that just like logically like mm -hmm. even ikea has that little thing at the front that says how was your experience today and we yeah. can give them direct feedback and you know to use a another dumb analogy like an architect wouldn't build a house without consulting the person who wants to build it so it seems to be such a crucial thing for research to actually get those people on that know how it works, who have lived it, who have been in it. And mm. I can't imagine all the researchers would have that experience. So yeah, it just makes sense to pull in the stories and um, yeah, capture them as best you can to use that to incite those progress, those steps forward. I think the That's other right. thing about the stories that are from those experts by experience is that they are so powerful and reach so many people and touch them in a way that's really memorable. I know that we always get 
case workers and um, other professionals sort of come up to us and say that thing that you said, that story that you told, I really remembered that. Yes, I remember hearing you speak from 10 years ago because you told this story and they'll retell a story that I've told 10 years ago. It's uh, something that is really impactful for people and it can hold that message that is really a huge learning point for a lot of people. Mm, thank you thank you so much, um, the three of you. We're going to come back um, in a little while and talk about the beautiful resources that you've developed also for this project, because that really captures a lot of what you're sharing here. And we're really excited to make those available to everyone to use. So for now, I'm going to um, pass it back to Professor Judy Cashmore, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thanks very much, Amy. And again, if you're coming in on Zoom or LinkedIn Live, we're happy to have your company and to ask a question, slido.com and use the code Sydney Ideas. You should be able to see that on your screen right now. It's now my absolute pleasure to welcome Peter, uh, Professor Peter Pecora from the School of Social Work at the University of Washington and also Casey Family Programs, where he has a wealth of experience um, of doing action research and working with government and with an organisation to change the way things happen for young people in foster care uh, in the US and the people he calls uh, care alumni. But I'd, it, Peter can tell you more about that. It's, I'd like to throw it over to him. Peter, we've heard from um, Amy and Billy and Bobby and Tegan about some of the initiatives that are happening here in Australia and what we can also do and the power of the voice of those who live with those decisions. And they're the, they're the views that we should really be hearing. Um, would you uh, give us, would you, can I throw to you now to give us some ideas of what you do in the US and what we can learn here from your experience? Thanks, Peter. Sure, Judith, thank you uh, for the introduction and the warm welcome and the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm gonna try and build on the excellence and wisdom that was just shared by, um, uh, by saying, you know, we're all about system change. And you heard that from Billy, Bobby, and Tegan. And um, one of the ways you get there is uh, it's called head, heart, and wallet. The head part is bringing in the quantitative data and the qualitative data that, you know, makes the case for the change you want to make. The heart part is what you heard Billy and Bobby speaking to, which is powerful, specific stories um, you heard Tegan mentioned too, the more specific you can advocate for something, the better off you're going to be. So that's part of the heart piece that people with expertise, uh, experts by experience, our community residents, our elders in our communities can really help shape change by bringing those powerful stories. And the wallet piece of this is increasingly, we're working with residents, birth parents, children in care and foster care alumni to do cost effectiveness or cost benefit studies, because we know for some of the excellent strategies that get um, piloted, they also save money, they save taxpayer dollars. And so the combination of quantitative and qualitative data, powerful stories that uh, bring background to that information and cost savings analysis, I think is a very, these are all opportunities where our stakeholders can really make a difference. Now, with respect to research um, and project planning grants, I'll, I'll mention a few things. Uh, we think this begins with an appreciation of what experts by experience bring, what community leaders bring, what community residents bring to a research project. And what that appreciation translates into is consulting with these key stakeholders at the very beginning of the project. What's the issue that we wanna study? Why is that issue so important? What do the stakeholders and the research team already know about that issue? And then how can we get answers to the most pressing questions that remain to be addressed? Um, so to give you a practical example, in our foster care alumni study that we did many years ago, we did a number of studies. Um, 
the young and the middle-aged foster care alumni, and that's a, a term of respect that the youth in care and the people who were formerly in care helped us come up with, the foster care alumni helped us edit our case record review instruments. They helped us choose and um, frame up and word the interview questions that we used when we, we called up or met in person with the um, foster care alumni to interview them. And then they also told us and advised us in what order the questions ought to be so that the two and a half hour long interview was as smooth and as comfortable as it could have been uh, knowing we were touching on some pretty sensitive subjects in, in that interview. So these alumni and the foster parents for this particular study or set of studies were invaluable in helping us establish, I think Billy Bobby mentioned, it's like a house, right? You want the right foundation on your house. And any research study, in, in our opinion, ought to have that foundation of stakeholder in, in, input right at the beginning. And then once we had some early data, we organized convenings of foster care alumni and some foster parents to help us make sense of the data. What's the story behind those numbers? What do those data mean? And what are some implications and the beginning pieces of recommendations that we ought to be drawing from that data? Um, the theme of our convenings, um, we borrowed from the uh, wonderful work that's been done on developmental disabilities. So every convening had a theme of nothing about us without us. That was the tagline, nothing about us without us. And the us in this case was the foster care alumni and the foster parents and the birth parents that we were talking to. Then once we had used all that input to craft the report and the messaging that we wanted to and the recommendations that we wanted to bring before policymakers and legislators and funders, then we teamed up again with those same stakeholders and they co-presented with us. And that is a powerful combination. And we didn't position them in the presentations at the end as reactors to the presentation. <laughs> we purposely teamed up and they helped us present the reasoning behind the study, the study methods, some of the findings, and also what they saw as recommendations coming out of the study. So it was a, a real, um, we benefited so much from their wisdom and energy and enthusiasm. And that's how we did it. We teamed up and a number of um, national laws were changed as a result of those presentations on that study and a number of other um, wonderful studies done by Trudy Festinger and uh, Mark Courtney and others. And then um, when it was time to disseminate the data even more, we, we made sure that uh, you know, those products had quotes, powerful quotes and stories embedded in the documents after we had done some of that testimony. I do want to end with one piece of, uh, of uh, wisdom we've learned over the years, and we're now um, doing that very widely here at Casey, at, at Casey Family Programs because we're working with a number of birth parent, foster parent, kinship care parent, American Indian tribal parent and stakeholder groups, and foster care alumni. And the important principle here with all those groups is you want to honor their time. And that means making sure they're adequately prepped to fulfill the role that you'd like to invite them to do and that they're paid for their time. So um, we would recommend that anyone really who's serious about this work, you really, as this project has done here at the University of Sydney and in Australia, they have thought very carefully, how do they reimburse people who have been contributing all along for their time? And that's what we're doing in the United States well. Uh, we have a long ways to go, but I wanted to share just a few ideas with you today about how you try to be, you know, really meaningfully involve your stakeholders from the very foundation of your work all the way through to the dissemination phases. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. It's been absolute delight to hear from you over the last few days and to learn and to have you part of this project. Um, and nothing about us without us, I think, should pretty much be the slogan. And that's really what we're talking about. Respect, 
uh, recognition and the ethics of doing work with people who live with all the decisions that are made about them. And I'd also like to just draw attention to the um, issue of Aboriginal culture and cultural understanding in all of this. And we have had part of that uh, in our, that is part of our project, but I think that's where we have so much to learn in this area. Um, but now I'd like to um, bring in the, bring us back to the members of the panel, Billy and Bobby and Tegan and Amy. Um, and I must say that over the last few days and the experience of working on this research project, I've just been blown away by the resources that have been produced by these three young women. Tegan, tips uh, for birth parents, which are so insightful, and Billy and Bobby, the books that you have produced for children are wonderful and we need to get them out there. And I know that, um, that you're talking, Peter, about getting them some traction in the US and distributing them there, but create the Association for Young People in Care and so on. There are all sorts of places, education and the Aboriginal books that have been produced uh, in conjunction with SBS, they're fantastic. So with that, I'd just like to throw first up to Tegan, Billy and Bobby. Could you tell us a little bit about the resources that you've produced? I've given away a bit of your thunder, Tegan, but can I start with you? <laughs> Um, yeah, so what we ended up doing was just putting together just some of the core important features that are sort of needed to help not just the birth parents engage with facts and um, DCJ workers and their NGOs, but more about focusing on how to make the best of your family time with your children. Because one of the things that is repetitively said, it's about quality, not quantity. And you can spend so much time focusing on that quantity of time, but while you're focusing on that, you're missing out on all the wonderful things that you could be doing. And these sheets aim to sort of help guide you through that emotional upheaval, how to deal with the big emotions as a birth parent going in and out, but also how to engage and see the perspective from other sides. So that is the goal of the tip sheets. And we've kept it in reasonable, simple language to sort of reach as many people as possible in as many situations as possible. And with some great graphics and so on. And I mean, Billy and Bobby have both got extraordinary skills in graphic design and art as artists and so on. Um, and it's so great to see what they've produced. So could I throw to both of you now to tell us a bit about what you produced? Well. I've got it right here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have made a 72 page tricks and, uh, tips and tricks guide for kids um, in the care system. It's kind of open with ages, you know, a, an intelligent seven, eight year old could probably find a lot of use from it um, all the way up until 15. Um, it's filled with kind of any, everything you'd need to know about family time. It's got chapters on your rights, um, on that, you know, why it's okay to not feel okay before or after family time, how to communicate, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Yeah, I think because we were saying before that children just don't know what they don't know. They don't know what their rights are. Um, I made a book for younger children, uh, probably sort of primary age and, you know, and fairly young, actually. Um, it's not too wordy, but it talks about, uh, you know, very child, has very child-friendly language um, to open up discussion in a range of different ways. It's designed to be either read alone by a child or used with a trusted adult. I've put an adult's guide um, through a QR code on the second page so that a trusted adult can um, go and have a look at that adult's guide and think about what discussions they could use this book to open with a child who is experiencing some of the struggles that uh, we know kids in care face and especially around family time emotional regulation, identity issues. That's great, thank you. And you're, we're going to hear from you a little later, I think in terms of reading that. Can I just ask you all now, um, how can we make sure that this research makes a difference, that we get it out there? 
Well, I think that the first thing about these resources, particularly, I saw um, on the Slido, someone was asking, you know, what resources are there for children in care who maybe have disabilities? And um, honestly, there is so little resources for children in care full stop. Um, certainly, I haven't seen any aimed at children this young. I have seen some aimed at teen, teens, but they tend to be uh, pamphlets disguised as comic strips that say don't do drugs don't go to jail condoms are really awesome um, and it's not really respectful it's not really practical and it's not you know uh, as useful as the information that an ex-teen in care can give teenagers so I think that the way that we make sure that this research makes a difference is by essentially copying the format that we've that we've you know that we've made here because if we have more experts by experience able to directly talk to other children in care and families who are currently experiencing this you know difficult situation that we've all gone through we'll have more resources that conversation can continue to go um, to move forward and you know if we can get these resources to actual hands to the actual people that they're intended for that's the that's the big thing that, um, you know, really that will end up coming down to uh, what Peter Pecora was saying before, that it, it is your heart and your brain and your wallet need to, you know, make a match to make that happen. Yep, I agree. If I can jump in there just to say too that we, we are working with our partner organizations they have been very dedicated to this project and that includes the Department of Communities and Justice. And we're also, you know, uh, working with um, peak bodies so with the Association of Child Welfare Agencies, ABSEC, we really want to get this out to the sector and we'll make all of these materials available for free. And we intend to package this up as a training so that people who come into out of home care can really access these resources in some context, get that information so that they have a practice toolkit. And then we've heard from caseworkers that they, they're they uh, charged with this really important task of sort of supporting these relationships, but they don't necessarily know how to do that. So we wanna make this available to people. And then with our relationship with Peter uh, and other um, academics, we wanna share this internationally. It's it's um, it's available for, by the pub, for the public. And this was funded by the public through Australian Research Council. It is now available for free as an online, you know, uh, flip book or it's published online and it is available for free if you want a digital copy. Um, but yeah, ideally we would have the people uh, who they're intended for get, get those physical hard copies. Yeah, if you look in the chat, I'm sure you'll find links that Amy has put in through. To yeah, thank you, Amy. Thank you. <laughs> You're on mute, Judy. Bobby, could I ask you to tell us a little bit about the music that you put in yours? Because I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, well, I included it. I'll just see if I can find it. Color coded pages has come in handy. Um, I included in mine, um, we talked a lot about um, the trauma responses, fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. So I created a Spotify playlist for each of those using Australian music. Because um, as a kid, music was huge for me. Like I used to absolutely blare Numb by Linkin Park on my Sanyo portable CD player anytime I felt misunderstood. Um, so I wanted to include songs that kids could listen to when they feel, you know, like they want to fight. There's like some nice loud songs on there. For flight, there's some more, you know, a lot more calming ones. So I'm hoping that that, you know, makes me feel like a cool youth <laughs> adding that in. Um, and I think we'll get some use. And even then, kids might be encouraged to make their own playlist to then listen to when they're feeling overwhelmed about family time, which was the end goal, really, to give kids the tools and the knowledge to be able to put in place their own process to understand their emotions and make a tricky situation less tricky. Right. One of the other questions that I um, wanted to throw to you all um, is you've all been involved in what we call co-design, and I should probably unpack some of the red, you know the jargon around that basically it means that as a whole research team with you as the experts by experience and us as the academics and Peter as the international uh, partner and and so on that it's been about how we design the questions that so we make sure we write ask the right questions right through to how we translate it so once we get the results what do we how do we get it out there so I just wanted to just ask you to reflect on what that co-design 
process is meant and whether there are any messages in that for other researchers and for practitioners. Maybe can I start with the US perspective, Peter, and just reflecting on that? You know, what's been really impressive about this project um, has been what you mentioned, Judith, was the co-design piece of it and the fact that there have been so many people from diverse roles teaming up and those very busy caseworkers, for example, they have full caseloads, they've got families and youth they're worried about, they've got birth parents they're trying to support, and yet they invested over two years of their life on a part-time basis in working with everyone um, to give the kind of encouragement that Tegan and Billy and Bobby um, uh, appreciated and helped them that they were on the right track with those wonderful resources that um, were created that you heard, you heard each of them speak to. The cultural, um, I term it cultural humility, but it's the, you know, that's that attention to culture that has emerged in that series of seven language and uh, workbooks um, is another fantastic piece of this. And the attention being paid to learning from elders, learning from the cultural community about who is the best set of supports for a child as you're trying to help them find permanency, you know, whether that's restoration or guardianship or um, adoption of some kind. So the, I was, I've been very impressed with that. And it's, it's, that's what it takes, I think, to have a project this successful. I'm going to call out a challenge for the Australian corporations and foundations here, which is, I think every child or parent involved in child welfare in Australia ought to have these three resources. And um, as Billy and Bobby have mentioned, and you mentioned, it's better when it's in hard copy Though some people like to download things and those, um, those some of the resources are really great online because they've been well designed. But I think this is where other sectors in Australia need to step up, just like we're calling on our other sectors in other countries to step up and really support our children and our families that are involved in child welfare. And I think these are resources that would really benefit from having many, many, many copies printed and then in the, in the hands and the offices and the community support centers around. So in terms of dissemination, I just wanted to call that out as a, a very important need there that would make everybody happy. Thanks, that is very much, Peter. Oh, just to Sorry, mention, Amy? Um, the Wiradjuri workbooks that have been designed mm -hmm. by our colleague, Lynn, uh, Lynn Lynette Riley, with her sister, Diane uh, Riley McNabo, are so exceptionally beautiful. They're, to, they're meant to be a relational way for children to spend time with family members doing language together, or actually language. And we hope it will be a model for other languages because we know that it's through families that children learn about their culture. And so uh, Lynn and Diane designed these books in the context of COVID when those family visits weren't happening. So there could be some way that families could connect and spend time together learning language. So the first uh, book in that series is made available via uh, SBS Learn under their languages tab. Uh, we'll put it in the chat as well. Uh, and that's also a book that we are hoping to get to all the children and families um, who are from um, the Wiradjuri language groups so they can learn wherever they are throughout New South Wales and throughout Australia. And they could be available in schools and, and so on as well. Can uh, just remember, you can ask questions by Slido or via chat. Um, and I'm going to check to see if we have any questions. Yeah, and if you have a look there, head to Slido dot com and enter the code Sydney Ideas to submit, view and upvote questions. And we're going to have a look at that now. Great, so you get to um, vote on which questions and so on. So have a look. So we've got uh, seven for the first question about recruitment processes. So. Yeah, so let's go with that one. So what recruitment processes did you use to find the experts by experience for your research? Really good question, because we, we hit the jackpot. We hit the jackpot, and I think we, we just got exceptionally lucky. Do you know, um, Tegan, we found out about you because you were part of the Living Library in Wollongong, 
And I live in Wollongong, you live yeah. in that way. And so um, that's how we learned about you because you we knew already that you were brave enough, you were willing to share your story, which really yeah. helped us. And so we invited you to be part of the project. Um, Billy Black, we, we knew about Billy because she's an artist that uh, also illustrated the Pathways of Care Longitudinal Study materials. So we knew about her and, and she may have, I think we think she may have done that when she was quite a young teenager, which is so amazing. Um, and so she was very well known to us. And then um, for Bobby, Bobby has been involved with us on a previous project, the Meanings of Permanency project, which is available on our website, which involved photographs that were taken by young people in the care system with uh, messages using photo voice about what mean what uh, permanency means to them. Um, and Bobby also did an amazing, uh, maybe let's speak about this exhibit at a, at, a, at a conference that was held by Department of Communities and Justice about her journey moving around care. Um, so that's how we, we learned about Bobby. And do you want to say a little bit more about that, Bobby? Um, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I did a um, personal project. I'm a photographer, so I like to have little personal things going to, you know, so I don't get lumped in mm -hmm. editing photos of just weddings all the time. Okay. And I decided I wanted to go and take photos of all the houses I've lived in, just, just as a personal project. And um, yeah, hunted them all down, managed to find about 40, took photos of them, and then presented that at the yeah, DCJ conference. And the best thing about that was, you know, I didn't have any real intentions for it, but hearing a lot of the caseworkers say how it impacted them, just a visual representation of what kids visually go through. Uh, and one of the people in that project, Freya, um, came up with this great idea of timing the video with the photos of how long I was there. So there were some long ones mm -hmm. and then there were some fast ones after. So just seeing that lack of permanency that I had as a kid in care, finally seeming settled in a place and then boom, Houses straight after. Um, so yeah, it was a really, really fun project and I'm glad it got uh, to be seen by people that it could impact. I just want to mention we have um, two other experts by experience that are part of our project, uh, Chantal uh, Rosie and Jacqueline Kale. And we also found them, you know, through you know organizations and through other ways that reflect on their personal experience, but really turn that into something where they wanted to create change for children and families in care. Thank you. Right. Yep. Uh, the next question, uh, and there are thanks for the stories. So for the people who, um, Tegan, Billy and Bobby, how do you work with researchers and how, how and why did you get involved? This is how we got you involved. How, why did you get involved? I got involved because I really liked the idea of being able to put the word expert on the resume, to be honest. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it was all over Zoom. It sounded like a really great opportunity to not only, you know, jump in with my passion to incite some change, but join a group of people that were all about that. So that's really why I did it. I think that, yeah, this is a really amazing opportunity because of the way that this project has approached data and approached uh, the idea of making uh, small, really good quality changes that they can then track with different learning sessions <clears throat> that has made it so that they have been able to put, uh, you know, uh, experts by experience in a, on a platform that, you know, where we can have our voice heard. It's not your average uh, person who has a lived experience of the care system that is able to immediately articulate uh, all of the trials and tribulations of um, their experience and what could change for the better immediately. But I think with this project, we had the opportunity and the support and the time as well to uh, be able to develop these resources in such a way that we were getting our message out there to the people that we wanted to hear that message um, in a way that was suitable for us to articulate what that message was. So, you know, we have this uh, background in design and art and writing, and the way that we've articulated this message is that we've used our strengths in order to make sure that the people that we need to hear those messages are getting them. Yeah, and we've heard how you got it, 
how you got involved, Tegan, not why. <laughs> Can you just give us a... I, I think it was just, in the, in the retrospect, it was just this amazing thing that happened that I spoke out and the first time I spoke out in public about my story, Susan found me. She was just on the ground with normal everyday people looking for someone and it was just so validating to find someone who found me and chose me to voice these things for people and and when you go through this experience your voice is pretty much taken away once you lose your children you've lost a lot of everything mm -hmm. and being a part of the project and having that opportunity it just was the most empowering thing that I got to do since the removal and it just really meant a lot to me to be a voice where there's not previously been voices before and it's meant a great deal to the project it's been really yeah. important can I just ask, actually, I'll throw again to you, Peter, how can we get more young people heard? And Bobby and Billy might have some thoughts on that too, I expect. Uh, two, two sort of practical ideas. Um, I hope Life Without Barriers is, is still active and strong in Australia along with CREATE because when I was here 10 years ago, they, they inspired me to, to continue doing my work. Uh, I had started this work with foster care alumni back in 2005, but you, you need a, a, a boost of encouragement every once in a while. Just keep at it because it's hard. It's, it's, uh, it takes a lot out of you, but, um, but it also gives a lot back. And so the two ideas I have for you is, um, is the, your youth and parent associations are a wonderful way along with these. And you heard Amy mentioned the, and, and Tegan, the local associations, right? And the local, those are great ways to, be alert for people who you would like to invite to involve in your projects. And then um, for the folks who are in government or um, some of the nonprofit, the NGOs, sometimes your accounting procedures might get in the way. So the suggestion I have is what we do at Casey Family Programs. We have contracts with three of the national associations that do a lot of work with birth parents, foster parents, and foster care alumni. And we set up contracts with them and then they help find, recruit, orient to prepare carefully and pay the um, key stakeholders, people with lived expertise that then we can involve in our planning projects, our testimony to policymakers and our research projects. So sometimes you've got to pull in a national association partner to help you with the finance and contracting and other things that many times government agencies or other agencies uh, have difficulty with. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. We actually are going to hear your voice in a different way, Bobby, because you're going. To, we're going. To, it's time to go to the video. At the, uh, sorry, Billy, uh, at this stage to uh, about the book. Um, look, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this. Thank you for all of you for being part of it on uh, Zoom and on LinkedIn, and those who listen via podcast and for putting in the questions. If there are any questions we haven't got to, we've got the record. We can get back to you if please make sure that you contact us at the Research Centre. Um, we, can, we can make sure that that's available later. But it's, um, and thank you so much for everybody being involved on the panel. Peter, it's been wonderful to have you here from, from the US after the visa problems, getting in here, the rain. Thank you to it for everyone, Tegan and Billy and Bobby for being part of it right throughout uh, the whole process and particularly today. And Amy, it's been great working with you. Look forward to much more. Thank you, over to you. And for the, um, we're now going to hear, um, see the video of Billy reading raw. It's great, thank you. Born in the jungle, my family's tough. We are fun in the good times and brave when it's rough. But when I don't really feel safe anymore, big feelings grow bigger and soon I feel raw. Over time, I can learn to love a new place, but it's tough when there's raw in your fur and your face. I'm glad, sad and mad and I'm ready to spring. I'm strong, so I always feel more than one thing. 
On the surface, I'm calm and goofing around, but inside those feelings are still mixing around. Even just one tiny bad feeling more. Big feelings grow bigger and soon I feel raw. Sometimes, even when things seem fine, I still just don't feel safe inside. And when I remember something that's sore, big feelings grow bigger and soon I feel raw. Kids are allowed to make lots of mistakes and I've got some good ways to handle those aches like breathing real slow and counting to 10 until my pores can relax again. I tell all the adults as much as I can about what feels best when I'm with my clan. Remembering times that we're sad or we're fun, big feelings grow bigger and soon I feel one, two, three, four, five, six,